Awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Alec Hammond from Georgia Tech. I'm a PhD student there. And today I'm going to be talking about high performance topology optimization for photonics inverse design. This will be somewhat of a follow on to the tutorial that I gave yesterday. Um, so hopefully we have some time that we can answer some of the questions that weren't addressed yesterday. Um, so here we go. And if you guys have questions for our remote viewers, feel free to post them in the question and answer section. Um, and we can answer those in real time as well. All right, perfect. So Stephen mentioned some of the, the advances within MEEP in the last several years and how there's certain, a, a, a sort of methodology for designing various devices. Um, typically, we, we look at some sort of figure of merit that we want to achieve when designing a particular device. And maybe we use some sort of physical intuition that we have as scientists or engineers. And we come up with some sort of geometry and we simulate it with me for some other tool, numerical tool. And we notice that it doesn't quite meet that specification. So we, the designer, have to then go back to the drawing board and think, how can we refine this design uh, such that it does perform and meet our specification? And this sort of iterative design flow where we have to rely heavily on our own intuition is commonly termed as forward design or classical design. And quite honestly, since it relies on you know, a very small amount of degrees of freedom that we can physically comprehend, due to the vastness of, of Maxwell's equations, there's so much more out there that we're not able to take advantage of using these traditional techniques. An alternative method that really gained traction in the last 10, 15 years, particularly with Maxwell problems, is this, this idea of shape optimization, where we start with this initial guess that we get from our physical intuition, and we just manually perturb the boundaries of our design using an optimization algorithm. And then a slightly different approach to this as something called topology optimization, which is what we focused our tutorial on yesterday. And the main difference between shape optimization and topology optimization is the way that we're able to completely change, quote unquote, the topology by nucleating new holes or islands in the geometry itself. That's something that, strictly speaking, shape optimization doesn't do. So these latter two categories, shape optimization and topology optimization, are commonly referred to as inverse design because we, the designers, lay out a specific set of figures of merit and design constraints, and we let the optimizer design the device for us. And if you guys have never seen topology optimization in action, I have this cool video that we can take a look at. So imagine that you guys are all silicon photonics designers, and your goal is to design a compact silicon photonic T-splitter, where light comes in from the left and splits immediately, evenly, on the top and bottom channels. And with density-based topology optimization, that gray region represent a, a, an image of pixels that we can freely choose between silicon and silicon dioxide. And I want the splitter to operate over 100 nanometers of bandwidth. So if we watch how our optimizer evolves this structure, it very quickly tries to bring that broadband performance over 100 nanometers up all the way across the band, and it slowly perturbs the pixels in a very unintuitive fashion. And it, and it gradually makes this design more and more binary. Now, pretty soon we're going to hit this point where the optimizer is faced with some design rule constraints such that it forces the design to not only be binary, as we can see here, but also with a prescribed minimum feature size that we, the designer, may have due to, let's say, a foundry or some other specification. And if we notice, the final design that we have at the end of the day is A, completely binary. It adheres to all those fabrication constraints, has extremely broadband performance. And the amount of time that it took to optimize the device at the end of the day wasn't necessarily prohibitive. In fact, in this case, it only took about 210 iterations. And in this particular example, since it's just 2D, it only took about 20 minutes on my, my MacBook here. Now, of course, every time we design a structure like this, we want to make sure it actually behaves well. So we run a full wave Maxwell solve, and we propagate the fields through it. And we want to see whether or not it really does split the light in a 50-50 fashion. And you notice. Of course, you know, luckily the optimizer did what it was supposed to, it split the light, but there's not very much field that exists over in that weird region on the right that we, the designers, didn't come up with ourselves. So we might naively ask ourselves, well, if there's no field over there, what if I just chop that region off and I just stick with the original T-splitting structure that I have on the left? But again, a lot of the, uh, the designer intuition that we have might help us realize like that, that structure over there is actually critically important. It's, it's acting as a sort of brag mirror to trap the light such that it doesn't shoot out towards the other side and it guides it evenly into each of those directions. So even though there's a lot of criticism these days with topology optimization being this black box technique that produces designs that have no physical meaning, that's not necessarily always true. Oftentimes, 
the physics is there in the geometry itself. We just have to look closely and try to understand what the meaning of the features are that they emerge. And hopefully this will help us gain better intuition about the physics and use that to design other structures, not necessarily with topology optimization, but with classical forward design methods as well. So yesterday during our tutorial, we talked about the different uh, steps to achieve topology optimization, and it's rather straightforward. We take that image of design pixels that I showed you, and we run it through a series of linear and nonlinear filters. We take that final geometry, and we do a forward maximal solve. This is just a simple simulation and MEEP, just to evaluate how well our splitter is performing. And then we run one additional simulation, which is called the adjoint simulation. And the results of the forward simulation with the adjoint simulation combined together give us the gradient with respect to as many degrees of freedom that we want. And I want to point out that oftentimes the degrees of freedom that we talk about with inverse design are the geometry itself, right? All of those pixels. But there's lots of other kinds of degrees of freedom that we could specify. For example, maybe I have a source and I want to find the ideal coupling angle of a source. We could just as well find that gradient as well using the, the appropriate adjoint formulation. So in other words, there's a lot of flexibility with the adjoint method. We just need to know a, a, an efficient way to implement, implement that in the code base itself. So another way to look at that, that pipeline and the efficiency that I, met, that I mentioned is to look at it step by step. So the first thing we do, as I mentioned, is we do a forward uh, simulation to evaluate the efficiency of our device. And if we were to do a brute force approach, we could alternatively manually perturb each individual pixel doing a simulation each time and doing a, a sort of finite difference approximation. So if I have a million different degrees of freedom, that means I have to run at least a million different simulations to compute that gradient. Okay, this is a very brute force approach. And, and then the advantage of the adjoint simulation is that physically or intuitively, it's leveraging things like the Born approximation and reciprocity to use a single simulation uh, to achieve the, the gradient with respect to all of those degrees of freedom. Now, whenever we think about adjoint methods within photonics, this is a very popular field right now. There are lots of different tools that leverage this. We need to somehow classify the various trade-offs that exist that will, help us edu that will help educate us when it comes to determining which tool to use for which particular problem we're addressing. So some of the trade-offs that we have to worry about, for example, are the design and figure of merit complexity. Okay, do I have lots of figure of merits that I care about for my particular device? Do I have to look at lots of different wavelengths and polarizations and mode field profiles? Similarly, do I, do I care about manufacturability or is this more of a theoretical upper bound? You know, do I just wanna see what the, the highest possible efficiency is or do I need to send my designs to a commercial foundry at the end of the day? Um, can I parameterize it in a, in a particular fashion? Yesterday, we talked about the differences between density-based optimization and level set optimization. This is an important factor when, when choosing a tool to use. Of course, how big is my device? Ultimately, or many times when we use inverse design, we try to shrink the size of our device as small as possible. But there are many devices that, by nature of the operation, cannot be shrunk. In this particular case, we have a grading coupler. And that size of the grading coupler needs to be at least as large as the incoming mode profile of the fiber, right? It's an aperture. So you don't necessarily, you can't shrink it. You need to have a tool that scales well with these really large problems. And of course, we wanna talk about how we implement robustness with uh, the design process. And then finally, multiple frequencies. You know, Is there an easy way that we can incorporate that in the optimization process? So ultimately, all of these are very important trade-offs that we must consider when, when doing our inverse design. So when we formulate our adjoint variable method that we just went over. There's lots of ways we could do it, whether we're using MEEP or some other arbitrary tool. But since we are using MEEP, let's, let's look at Maxwell's equations in the time domain. And we can immediately recognize that if we wanted to compute an adjoint method for that, we could, we could do a time domain adjoint equation. Okay, that's actually a very straightforward way. Um, but there's a couple caveats with that. Um, first off, there's significant storage requirements that go along with doing a pure time domain adjoint formulation. And second of all, a lot of the designs and devices that we want to design depend on frequency dependent um, parameters, like scattering parameters, for example. So it may make more sense instead to formulate Maxwell's equations in the frequency domain and then simply come up with the adjoint formulation that corresponds to that. Um, this is done in several codes uh, from various groups, both in industry and academia. 
Uh, but there's a few trade-offs and disadvantages with this approach as well. As Stephen mentioned earlier, frequency domain codes typically only solve for one frequency at a time. So if our figure of merit depends on lots of frequencies, this is gonna get very expensive very quickly. But another important challenge is FDFT codes and generally speaking, frequency domain codes itself don't necessarily scale well to really large problems. Okay, it requires some sophisticated preconditioners which depend on the problem and it requires a lot of thought ahead of time and it's just not very scalable. So, but the time domain Maxwell's equations like FDTD do in fact scale very well as, as Stephen talked about. So what if we still use our FDTD solver but we accumulate the frequency domain adjoint quantities using a discrete time Fourier transform, which means we have to come up with the corresponding operator that describes that evolution, and we have to compute the adjoint formulation for that new operator. So from there, we have this new, what we call hybrid domain adjoint equations, where we can compute the gradient for lots of different frequencies simultaneously, and we can scale that to really large domain problems with many wavelengths in each dimension. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other specific uh, advantages to using the topology optimization features that we have within MEEP. One of the most important things is MEEP has this really nice Python user interface that lets, it, lets us easily describe our geometry and, and particular quantities that we're trying to measure, whether that's uh, steady state fields or pointing flux or mode monitors. Well, it turns out it's just as easy to, de to describe all of those features using the adjoint suite because it uses the same underlying code base. So for example, we can have design regions that correspond to multiple layers. We can have multiple monitors and differentiate with respect to multiple monitors. Um, we can of course design over multiple frequencies. We can use dispersive and anisotropic materials, lossy materials. And most importantly, we can compose objective functions that are completely differentiable. We have two backends, as I mentioned earlier, we can use either Autograd or JAX. So that means that we can fit with a variety of end-to-end -end optimization frameworks, which I know Zinn, Lynn will talk about later. Um, and the objective functions themselves can depend on far field transformations or diffraction orders like we saw. There's a, in other words, there's a lot of flexibility with what we can design. Um, and, and to kind of highlight that, this is a polarization splitter that we designed and fabricated at Global Foundries. This particular polarization splitter had the task of routing a TE polarization to one arm and a TM polarization to the other arm, and it used two standard foundry layers, and it relied on two objective functions to do that. The first objective function co was composed of three independent scattering parameters for the TE mode, and then the second objective function used three other scattering parameters for the TM mode over a wide range of wavelengths. So there's a lot going on here, but we're very, it's very easy to encapsulate all of that using these objective functions within MEEP. And what, this is kind of cool. You can kind of see the, the fabricated devices here um, from a micrograph image that we took here. So in order to efficiently simulate all of these devices, we need a, a way to distribute all of the load. Uh, to, and and th this is typically called domain parallelism um, or load distribution. And me very easily distribute your simulation across multiple processors, multiple nodes that could be even across different locations in space, different data centers, as long as they're connected on the same network. Uh, MEEP is very robust in the way that it can distribute really large simulations and kind of leverage uh, computational parallelism in that fashion. But similarly, MEEP takes advantage of something called frequency parallelism, where we can compute the gradient at multiple frequency points simultaneously. We'll talk about how we do that specifically. And then of course we have something called objective parallelism. I previously mentioned that the polarization splitter that we simulated had two objective functions. We were able to compute the gradients of both those objective functions in tandem because of this feature that we have right here. Effectively, we just slapped on another compute node and we had one objective function being computed on this one and another objective function being computed on this one. But you can use the same code pipeline such that the gradients recombine, you can use the same optimizer, and it's very seamless. The whole idea here is to make it as easy as possible to design complicated structures. Okay, in order to do these broadband adjoint sources like I discussed, like here we see there's three different scattering parameters, S2, 1, S1, 1, and S3, 1, across about 100 nanometers of bandwidth. We need a way to take our frequency domain adjoint quantities and create time domain adjoint sources, right? And that's essentially just a simple fitting problem where all we have to do is we take some sort of basis function that maps to our frequency domain quantities. We need to weight them by that appropriate amount. We just sum those together thanks to linearity. And now we have a adjoint source that corresponds 
to our figure of merit that we're trying to optimize. And that's how we do everything under the hood uh, rather efficiently. Um, Mo talked about briefly yesterday, another optimization that we perform, which you're back propagating through near to far adjoint calculations. Um, rather than simulating an entire metal lens structure here where you have the focus, the structure itself, and even the, the, the area of space beyond, we can dramatically collapse your simulation domain down to just the region right above and right below the structure itself, and then project what the fields would be using the greens function and the near to far transformation. Okay. The, the parameterization methodology that MEEP relies on uh, is something called a material grid. And the, the idea here is you, the designer, should not have to worry about the E grid, the underlying disparatization of the simulation domain, because you may be doing one simulation at one particular resolution and you need to change the resolution depending on how your simulations go, right? So all you have to do is specify in this material grid your arbitrary design parameters. It automatically interpolates those onto the material grid, the E grid as needed and we'll back propagate through those as well. And what's really cool about this is you can project your 1D, 2D, or 3D degrees of freedom onto any actual dimensionality of the simulation structure, as you can see here in this top right. You can also enforce arbitrary symmetries by overlapping different uh, material grids on top of each other. You can rotate them, as you can see here, and it'll average them together. There's a lot of flexibility with the kinds of structures that you design. And as Steven mentioned earlier, if you're just clever with how you parameterize the device, you can dramatically alleviate the optimization trajectory that you have to uh, go through. So finally, uh, this is a brief review of what density-based topology optimization specifically addresses. The, the basic idea is you want to evolve those pixels bit by bit until you get a nice binary structure at the end of the day that performs well, right? And as we saw yesterday, there are lots of different filters and projection steps that are required in order to get there. And it could be rather intimidating uh, to choose the right filter and the right projection step. And that's where a lot of the, the designer intuition and the designer art comes into play. It requires a lot of trial and error to figure out which of these functions work best for a particular problem. But most importantly, Meet makes it really easy to try these different functions such that you don't have to manually compute the gradient of a different filter kernel. You know, it's very straightforward and the prototyping path is, is almost streamlined. Okay, but today I wanna to specifically talk about this idea where you don't necessarily have to be restricted to a density-based method within MEEP. Okay, we, we've tried to generalize this beyond density-based methods um, such that we can incorporate level set methods it's, as well. And, and the reason this works is the density-based method is actually an implicit level set parameterization. You can see here, if I have my design parameters row, um, and I, I can choose an arbitrary point along this path after I filter to, to project. And if I project here at one value of eta versus another value of eta, I have dramatically different eroded and dilated geometries, right? Well, this right here is exactly what a level set function does. So if, if we get clever with the math and we do some important integrals to get rid of that sharp discontinuity of the projection function, we can actually create a, what's a, a new parameterization scheme that allows us to continuously evolve our projection parameter beta all the way to infinity, such that we get an actual discontinuity there, but it's completely differentiable and behaves just like a level set function. So I really wanna highlight this graph right here. This shows what happened if you use a, if you use a traditional density-based method, as you evolve beta, you see that the gradient gradually goes to zero. And this is a big challenge within topology optimization right now is you can't make beta too high, otherwise your, your optimization is gonna get stuck. We're able to overcome that challenge by using this new hybrid density and level set technique. We can scale beta as high as we want and it'll converge to the actual gradient of the shape around it. Um, and, and the way that we're able to do that is by leveraging subpixel smoothing under the hood. We actually use subpixel smoothing as a sort of way to uh, integrate out that discontinuity that I was talking about. So in other words, we, we still use the same density based framework where we have a filter and projection step, but now we use information from both of these from the filtered step and the projection step to create this new subpixel smoothed feature uh, that, that uh, gives us the information that we need to compute the gradient. So this is an example that we did within me. This is a simple splitter, or sorry, it's a crossing, a waveguide crossing. And rather than starting with the gray regions, the gray 0.5 values that we're so used to at topology optimization, we started with an intuitive guess, just a simple waveguide crossing. And we wanted to see what the, the level set optimization uh, would do to that if it could optimize it. And you can see that it's just slowly perturbing the boundaries. 
until it gets to this, this interesting structure here that actually looks a lot like what we see in the literature with shape optimization, and it performs particularly well. So I wanna highlight that this shape optimization is using the same underlying framework as the density-based tools. But now the only difference is we just turn beta all the way to infinity and we just let it optimize um, just like before. So now we can get really clever. We can take the, the advantages of both paradigms. We can use the fact that density-based optimization is really good at finding initial conditions where we just start with this blank gray region because we have no idea what a good initial condition is. That's what we see with this, this variant. We slowly come up with this interesting waveguide crossing here. And then once we get to a suitably high beta, we just ramp it all the way up to infinity and we do shape optimization on it, which is what we did right here. And you can see that it, it met DRC parameters for us and we get an unintuitive crossing, but it took advantage of both density-based and level set optimization in the same framework. Okay, so being able to embed Foundry DRC constraints in the optimization pipeline uh, can be a bit overwhelming because there are so many things you have to consider. So many people, when they do density-based topology optimization, look at things like your line width or line spacing, which are often called uh, your minimum feature size. Other people also look at your curvature. So this is a particular class of DRC violations called 1D violations. But there's an entirely new class of DRC violations um, that in my opinion are even more restrictive than 1D violations. Um, these 2D violations are the area and enclosed area, your islands and your holes within your geometry. And it was really difficult to come up with designs that simultaneously satisfied both of these because uh, as of a few years ago, there were no explicit constraints that accounted for these area violations. Um, but luckily we, we came up with some interesting mathematical formulations that allows us to simultaneously optimize through all of these different DRC violations and produce designs that uh, adhere to those. And not only that, we can produce high performing designs um, that work for a variety of different design rule rule books. Every foundry you work with is gonna have slightly different values depending on the tooling that they're using under the hood. So I can design different splitters uh, depending on different area or enclosed area constraints. I can divine, design certain splitters for increasing line width or line spacing constraints, or I could take the Cartesian product of that and come up with any arbitrary constraint combination that I have, whatever foundry I'm working with, I could still produce high performing designs. And you can see here, most of these are 49%, 49% uh, with very little variation across 100 nanometers. Now I wanna highlight something important. This design right here, which is supposedly the most lax, you know, has very small feature sizes, very small area restrictions, actually performs rather poorly at 27%. So this is very unintuitive as the designer, because I would think if I have no constraints, the optimizer should very easily come up with a design that works well, right? Especially since all of the other designs worked rather well. At the very least, my optimizer should have converged to one of these guys since these all satisfy his design rule checks. And this highlights a challenge in general with not just topology optimization, but optimization in general, especially machine learning, is you're always gonna hit these local minima, right? And there's so many other parameters, hyperparameters, like we talked about yesterday, that we have to play with to reliably get good designs at the end of the day. So if you, if you go through a full optimization and you end up with a structure like this that looks rather poorly, you don't get discouraged. What you do is you, you look at some of those other things that I mentioned yesterday, like the size of your design region or how far apart your waveguides are. In this case, the only thing I had to tweak was an optimization constraint threshold, okay? I just changed it by an order of magnitude. And just doing that and rerunning the optimization, I got the best performing device at 49.9% with less than 0.1% variability across the entire band. And that was just perturbing one particular parameter by a small amount. So in other words, don't get discouraged. It just requires a little bit of trial and error and understanding which parameters affect what type of design parameter you're, curr you're currently working on. So yesterday during the tutorial, we spent a long time talking about uh, robust optimization, especially in the Q&A, but I didn't really talk about the, the details of that process. So the reason why MEEP is so well suited towards addressing robust optimization is that you can do multiple simulations in parallel, multiple optimizations in parallel. So if I wanted to design a typical splitter like you see in the upper left-hand corner, that splitter is not gonna be inherently robust to things like overetching or underetching. But if I explicitly account for my overetching and underetching in the optimization process itself, like you can see with this structure down here, 
then A, the optimizer comes up with a completely different design than what you see over here. And B, it's now explicitly tolerant to those particular perturbations. In fact, this splitter is 25 times less, less uh, experiences less variability than the nominal design that we saw earlier. So it's very straightforward to incorporate robust optimization using the current pipeline. And you can do it with arbitrary metrics like we talked about yesterday. You could do it with changes in your refractive index, which could be due to things like temperature or fat variation. In this case, we did over and under etching. You can do uh, random variations, things due to sidewall roughness. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things that we can come up with. And that's actually a big research problem right now is there's lots of random variability and we need to come up with clever ways to incorporate that random variability and the loss that it induces into the optimization process, such that we get devices that truly perform well once they're fabricated. This is a simple experiment that we did. I don't wanna to spend too much time today talking about experiments, but I just wanna show that the robust optimization does indeed work. We designed a simple 50-50 splitter for a commercial foundry platform. And we saw that, and this is completely passive, of course, and the design showed less than two to 3% uh, variability across multiple wafers um, across almost 100 nanometers of bandwidth. So that's, that's significantly better than the state of the art. You know, typically splitters experience anywhere between 10 to 30% variability. So we were very excited by these results. Okay, I also briefly wanna talk about um, the flexibility with doing phase sensitive objective functions. The splitters that we saw earlier uh, we're strictly describing the power, but of course, if we also care about the phase response of the device, there's lots of ways you can formulate that objective function uh, to produce that device. So in this case, I could look at the air vector magnitude of the phase and magnitude response of my output arms, or alternatively, I could look at the phase uh, over the, the splitting ratio, the complex splitting ratio and the insertion loss, or better yet, why don't we just use reciprocity? Let's inject the complex response into the output ports and just maximize the power on the input ports. That way we can dramatically simplify the, the resulting optimization problem. So this kind of paradigm is something that we call phase injected topology optimization um, and is an interesting way to, to formulate our research problem. Using this technique, we were able to design a 90 degree hybrid, a very the world's smallest 90 degree hybrid at just eight microns by eight microns. And for those of you who don't know, a 90 degree hybrid takes all of the four quadrature points and routes your, your two inputs and interferes them according to those four quadrature points. So it's actually a very complicated transfer function to, to accomplish on chip, especially in such a small compact area. But by using MEEPS tooling to, to do this um, phase injected topology optimization, you can get phase sensitive devices as well. I also wanna highlight that we designed really large scale uh, polarization grading couplers. In this case, this was a dual polarization grading coupler, but we also designed just a standard grading coupler and you can see that we can take advantage of both layers right here. Um, we can use a symmetry condition through the middle such that we send one polarization state one way, another polarization state the other way, um, and we can get some really cool performance. We take advantage of near to far transformations here too, such that we don't have to simulate the entire domain like you see here, but we just simulate a small segment of the domain down here. And that makes it significantly more computationally efficient. We also fabricated those devices. You can kind of see this is the dual polarization grading coupler and the single polarization grading coupler uh, from Global Foundries. And then finally, I just want to end here on saying, you know, you can take this all the way to the next level, not just designing individual devices, but with the idea that these devices are going to go inside of a system. So this is a very specific kind of receiver called a Stokes vector receiver, uh, which takes advantage of a lot of the DSP algorithms for long haul telecommunication systems, but has the power requirements of Datacom. And what's cool about this is we could take all of those different devices that I showed you earlier, these polarization grading couplers, the 90 degree hybrid, these asymmetric splitters, cascade those together. We fabricated that on a commercial foundry platform on multiple wafers, and it worked remarkably well. And not only that, but the final device at the end of the day was orders of magnitude smaller than the state of the art. So that means a company could, uh, effectively a company could take this and increase their yield by orders of magnitude as well. So that the capability of topology optimization isn't just limited to the design level, but expands to the system level as well. So with that, here's some, if you guys are interested, here's a series of relevant publications that talk both about the theoretical aspects that I've talked about with MEEP and some of the fabrication validation that we've done. I haven't focused much on the fabrication during this talk. I really wanted to focus on the, the highlights of topology optimization within MEEP. But if you do wanna learn more about that, I defend my PhD on Wednesday. Feel free to uh, let me know if you'd like to attend remotely and I'll talk a lot about those results. And I wanna thank everybody who uh, helped us throughout this long process. We've been working really hard on the adjoint tooling
within me for the last three years now. And we could not have done it with just one person or two people. It was definitely a team effort. So thank you for your time and let me know if you guys have questions. Yep. So to mute themselves. So I just want to remind uh, people that they can type their questions in the Zoom Q and A. So if there's a, if you look in the bottom of the Zoom window, there's a, a, a button that says Q and A. So you can type questions there. And uh, I think panelists should also be able to unmute themselves and ask questions. But I, th I think there are already t a couple of typed questions in the Q and A. So the the first uh, question in the Q and A uh, was from uh, Guangyang uh, uh, Zhao, and they asked. Uh, what are uh, density-based filters used for? What are the filters for? Yeah, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, so I really encourage you to look at the recording once, once that's posted. But in the meantime, the filters have two purposes. One is to help us enforce minimum length scale constraints, and two, it regular, regularizes the optimization process. Yeah, good question. So another question uh, from Benjamin uh, Zamosvalfi. Uh, is could you expand on how the phase method works? The third method you mentioned in the phase slice of the phase injection. Yeah, I was running low on time, so I couldn't really elaborate on that one. But uh, the basic idea is you just leverage reciprocity to reformulate your objective function. So if you care about having a device that has a very particular phase profile on the output, sometimes we call this a code word on the output, then you flip the device and you inject that code word and you just maximize the power on the input. Um, but feel free, we can talk afterwards too about, uh, we recently submitted a paper that really goes through the details of this uh, rigorously. But it's not on archive yet, is it? Unfortunately, you, you, no. Okay. <laughs> Another question uh, from Thomas Napoleon Arg uh, was, uh, are, are there any limitations on using inverse design? Like what, what, where doesn't it work? Yeah, I didn't talk about that. So let me talk about it in the context of the MEEP tooling that we have, because obviously there's, there's limitations in general, right? But let's limit the scope a bit. Um, because we use a time domain code under the hood, okay, we have to wait for the time domain fields to converge such that we can calculate the steady state response. And that means that if we have a very resonant structure that we're trying to design, like some sort of ring resonator or, or something with a really high Q, we have to wait a really long time for those simulations to end. Now there's ways around that. We talked about yesterday about using things like pod A approximates, um, but those also have some caveats. So keep in mind that there's always this, this, this time frequency duality that we have to uh, consider when designing our devices. Yeah, I would also say that in MEEP's time domain uh, adjoints rely on you know, linear time invariance. So if your system is strongly nonlinear or time varying, then it won't work. But that, that doesn't mean the inverse design won't work, but it means you need a more, a, a more clever method. Are there any questions from the, from the uh, live audience here? Yes, Ryan. I have a question about this coupling of the level set method using the mm -hmm. pixel smoothing and whether or not, like how does this prevent something like cavitation of new features within a, a already uniform um, part of your epsilon, right? Yeah, great question, Ryan. So the, the idea, let's say beta is infinity, okay? At that point you are doing shape optimization. And 99.99% .99 of the time, you're not gonna nucleate new holes or islands. I have seen it occasionally where it does populate something, but that's typically because of some discretization error that it then latches on and tries to grow exponentially, right? But most of the time as shape optimization, you don't nucleate new holes or islands. But the advantage of this approach is you don't have to start at beta equals infinity. You could start at beta equals two and just do classical density-based topology optimization. And during those stages, that's when you can nucleate as many holes and islands as you want. And you only ramp it up to infinity once you kind of hit this point where you're like, okay, I really need a binary design now. So just to elaborate on that, uh, so if you're doing shape optimization with level sets, uh, I mean, how you take the derivative really radically changes at the point where you nucleate a hole or two surfaces touch or in general when the topology changes. So it is possible to do that, but you need to implement a very special differentiation technique to, to differentiate through changes in topology. And the subpixel averaging technique we're using right now, it, it, it won't give the correct derivative. Uh, when that happens. And so what, what that means is the optimizer just won't, won't try to do that because it, 
because it'll, it'll get stuck if it tries to change the topology. Are there other questions from the, if, uh, or from the, any of the panelists that uh, uh, want to unmute and uh, ask anything? Otherwise, we can take a break. Oh, one. Hey, Alex. Um, can you say, I know we've talked about this, but can you elaborate on why we think that we typically do things over 100 nanometers of performance, but a discrete number of frequency mm -hmm. points are chosen, yet we believe it's well behaved in between. Can you just say more about how, how we build some confidence on that? Yeah, as Dr. Ralph knows, we just got some review comments about this. So this is probably why he's, he's bringing it up. But yeah, this is a good, a good uh, question. You know, it, we're optimizing over discrete wavelength points. And the band that we're covering is 100 nanometers. That's a lot of optical bandwidth. So how do we know how finely we need to sample that such that the points in between actually behave like we would expect them to? It's nice and, and smoothly varying. And the, the short answer is, well, you never know for sure until you do a simulation after the fact, right? So before I say anything else, always make sure you, you verify things by just doing another MEEP simulation with a really dense grid, because that's really easy to do, right? It's when you optimize with really fine uh, points that it starts getting a little bit more expensive. But we can start to, to take advantage of things with Maxwell's equations to help us give insight into how finely we should put those points. So if, if we know our structure is going to operate over a broad bandwidth, then it's probably not going to have a lot of resonances, which are really going to uh, create those really weird discontinuities between those points. So in this particular case, I think I sampled points that are like every 10 nanometers or so. Um, and so I was fairly confident that I wouldn't have any weird resonances or things like that. And especially if you do things like robust optimization, you're definitely not going to have resonances at that point, right? Um, so it's just kind of this balance of, of using your design, your intuition, and understanding you know, the basics of Maxwell's equations uh, to help you choose that wavelength spacing. Hello, can I ask a question? I think a panelist is trying to ask a question. Is that right? Oh, is Zin's trying to unmute? Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Very faintly. Let's turn it up here. Hi, um, how about now? Yeah, we can hear you, Zen. It's just very faint, but we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, hi, this is Jordan. I'm from uh, Whittier oh. College. I just am um, curious about when you say uh, broad bandwidth, uh, what, is the, uh, what are the limitations that lead to the constraint here? Like 100 nanometers is considered broad. So if you wanted to expand that, um, you know what? What what stops you from from going to two hundred nanometers broad? You know, in in the um, wavelength space, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question, Jordan. So let's let's talk in relative units here, because I know you do a lot of RF stuff, right? So in, in this case, one hundred nanometers was about you know fifteen ten percent of my optical carrier frequency, which actually isn't that much bandwidth, right? Um, so and that and that. So that, that begs the question, well, maybe I could do 200 nanometers of bandwidth. And the issue there isn't necessarily computational in nature. I could easily expand my forward source such that it does cover 200 nanometers, provided I don't excite any weird you know, spurious stuff and my, my discretization is, is, is suitable, et cetera. Uh, but it might be that the optimization problem is, starts to get a little ill-conditioned at that point, right? It's really hard to come up with a structure that satisfies lots and lots of bandwidth. So in other words, I'll, I'll reiterate, the issue isn't necessarily computation or computational inherently, but maybe physics-based such that it performs well. And Steven's gonna add to that. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to add that, I mean, we've, we've done optimization problems where, where you're designing, maybe not covering continuously broadband with, but for example, multiple bands. So you design something that works well at both one microns and 10 microns wavelength or, or, or one micron and five mi mi micron wavelengths. And it's definitely possible to do that with the poly optimization. You see these structures emerging that have two radically different length scales in them. Uh, so so that, that, that's doable as well. And it's very straightforward to set up in the current framework, I'll add. You, just, you can add as many sources as you want, such that you don't have to have a single Gaussian that spans that. So it's, it's very straightforward. 